and welcome back to part two of the ecology series in biology. This is brought to you by the Division of Education, Innovation and Energy e-learning program. So what will we be doing today? You will be able to define food chain and food webs, define various levels of consumers, explain special relationships and explain the role of decomposers. So food chains. We all have heard about food chains. A food chain shows the path of energy from one living organism to the next. So how do we do that? By the use of arrows. The arrow denotes is eaten by. And what is being eaten by, you have to use the arrow heads to determine what is doing the eating. So the insect is eating the plant, the mouse is eating the insect, and the owl is eating the mouse. Now a food chain always starts with a producer. Producers are also known as your autotrophs. These are the plants and animals that make their own food. So they always start your food chain. So everything else in your food chain beyond the producers would be considered consumers. And we have different levels of consumers. The first or primary level, that stands for primary, would be your herbivores. Your herbivores eat only plants. So your sheep, your goats, cows, etc that are your primary consumers or your herbivores. The secondary level or secondary consumers can either be a carnivore or an omnivore. An omnivore is an animal that eat both plants and animals. So omnivores include pigs, mouse, etc. Humans are also omnivores. We eat both plant and animal. And then your tertiary and depending on the size of your food chain, you can have quaternary. These tend to be only carnivores. Carnivores eat only meat. So here you have a simple food chain showing four levels from your producer to your top predator in this particular example, which would be your owl. So your food chain is an unbroken link that is not usually longer than five or six organisms and it shows the path that energy takes from one organism to the next so the insect is going to get energy from the plant that energy is going to be passed on to the mouse but the mouse will not get all the energy that the plant provided the insect so you have a decrease in energy flow as you move down a food chain because for example the owl is not going to get all the energy from the mouse because the mouse will use some of its energy to, to grow to find a mate to find food so it is using its energy as it survives so when the owl eats the mouse it's not going to get all the energy from the when the owl eats the mouse it will not get all the energy from the mouse and so forth and so forth so energy decreases as you go down a food chain now here is a food web. A food web is made up of several interconnecting food chains. So here we have, I'll show you the pathway of one food chain. So we have grass eaten by grasshopper, which is then eaten by an owl. So that is one food chain. Here is another grass eaten by mouse who is eaten by a rat who is then eaten by the owl. So that's a second food chain. Another food chain, we have grass eaten by rabbit which is then eaten by the owl. So you are seeing several interconnecting food chains to make one food web. Your food web also shows animals which are dependent upon another for its survival. So for example,
This snake is dependent upon this rat for food. However, this mouse is dependent upon grasshoppers and mouse for food. So you're seeing that the snake and the rat are dependent upon different organisms for their survival. So your food web shows several interconnecting food chains and shows several layers of interdependency. Here is a forest food web. Now these are not organisms from locally, but your syllabus does require you to show knowledge of not just local animals. So we have, for example, grass eaten by deer, which is then eaten by a coyote. Another food chain, grass eaten by squirrel, eaten by coyote. Let's look at this squirrel. This squirrel is eaten by coyote. It is also eaten by a hawk. So this food web is showing you that one animal can provide food for several different organisms. Here is a marine-based food web. You can see, again, a lot of interconnected food chains, and you're seeing interdependency. So let, us, let me ask you a question. Here we have fish. If a disease were to wipe out all the fish, what effect would it have on this food web? Take a close look. This fish is eaten by seagulls. It's also eaten by leopard seals. So if something were to wipe out all the fish in this particular ecosystem, this seagull population is going to decrease because it, the, its food source would have been removed. The leopard seal, however, may not be as affected as the seagull. And why is that so? Because the leopard seal has another source of food in the form of penguins. However, because of the removal of the fish, all the animals that the fish would have fed on, for example, zooplankton, these are going to increase in their population size. So this is going to grow or reproduce rapidly while the seagull population is going to decrease. Another question. Can you identify two different competitors in this food web? Look here. We have the penguin and the elephant seal both competing for squid. This is the food source of both the penguin and the elephant seal. There's another one. We dealt with it earlier. Here is the fish. The leopard seal and the seagull both compete for fish. Here is another food web. However, I personally consider this a very bad example of a food web. And why do I say that? If you look closely here, we have the carpenter ant, an aphid which sort of resembles a grasshopper, and caterpillar. They, based on how this one is drawn, it appears as if the ant is just a producer, which we know it is not. So your food web must start with a producer, food web or food chain. So if we were to draw the ant eating the fern, likewise the aphid feeding on lichen or even on fungi, then it will now be a complete food web. So remember, your food web must start with a producer, anything that can make its own food. Likewise, we'll put the caterpillar eating an acorn. Okay, so based on this food web, now that it is complete, I want you to determine a predator and a prey. P R E Y, prey and predator. 
So a predator is the animal that does the hunting and the prey is the animal that is hunted. So in this example, for example, the cougar would be the predator because it is hunting squirrels or it is also hunting mountain beavers. So you have to know various characteristics that allow for predators to be successful in their environment as well as for prey to be successful in their environment because a prey has to find means of preventing themselves from becoming someone's lunch and a predator has to be effective in hunting to be able to find food for survival so for example the cougar may be quite swift it has large canine teeth for ripping through flesh it has the ability to camouflage among maybe um, dried grass this flying squirrel because it can fly it can escape quickly from its potential predator or because it is much smaller can find ways to hide that will prevent the cougar from finding it so every organism is specially adapted for its environment either as a predator or a prey i would just like to point out one other thing sometimes an organism in one ecosystem can be a prey and in another ecosystem it might be a predator so let us attempt to create our own food web here is a picture of a mangrove area in southwest tobago what sort of organisms do we find in a mangrove area of course loads of crabs and different species of crabs too we have mosquitoes and that mosquito would would represent all insects whether flies and um, butterflies other insects in the mangrove area we have small fish nursery fishes which use the mangrove as an area to grow we have termites which will be found on the stems of some of the mangrove trees seagrass found in the water areas larger fish for example this powered fish here several species of spiders several species of birds of course we would have turtles slugs worms any of those ground um, soil based organisms and loads and loads of leaf litter from the mangrove trees so the mangrove bed is littered with lots of mangrove leaves that are decomposing okay so here i've brought over all of the organisms mentioned previously so we are now going to attempt to draw our food web remember the web is interconnected food chains so we start with our producers which i have at the base and we are now going to determine which of these animals are going to eat or feed on these producers so we have termites which are found on the stems or barks of the mangrove tree we have worms and slugs which, which will take advantage of the leaf litter we have crabs which are also going to eat bits of the leaf litter maybe bits of mangrove stems that have fallen we have ants which will be found on the trees turtles please note where the arrow heads are facing then the nursery fish are going to take advantage of the seagrass the adult fish are going to eat the nursery fish spiders your ants and your dragonflies your dragonflies are going to be found maybe on your mangrove trees your kiskidi or your birds which eat spiders spiders also may take advantage of your termites and your heron which would be your bigger fish will eat your bigger birds sorry which would eat maybe the kiskadees or more appropriately your adult fish so here is a 
food web of a local ecosystem. So now we want to look at the words trophic levels. So your trophic level contains organism of the same function. So here we have one trophic level which contains all of your producers. The next trophic level contain all of your primary consumers, so all of your herbivores. The next trophic level, which will be above, contains your secondary producers, your secondary consumers, sorry. These would be either your omnivores or some carnivores. And of course, your tertiary trophic level will contain your tertiary consumers, or the top trophic level will contain your top predator or your carnivores. Now the size of the bar determines maybe the number of organisms in that particular environment or it may determine, it may show the mass of the organisms in that particular environment. So most pyramids do have this particular shape. However, sometimes your pyramid may take an inverted shape. So let us say, hypothetically, we have one mango tree. So it's one mango tree. So the base is very small, but that one mango tree may have 25 parakeets. Some small type of bird. And then that mango tree may have three snakes. So the size of the next level is going to be much smaller. And then that mango tree may also have one owl. So here we have an inverted pyramid based on the particular ecosystem. In this case, we have an arboreal or tree-based ecosystem. Now we want to look at the function of decomposers. These are very, very important in every single environment. So decomposers are usually organisms, mostly bacteria or fungus, that feed on dead complex organic matter and turn them into simple organic matter. Usually, these nutrients are released into the soil. So decomposers are the smallest organisms found in any e ecosystem, but they are the most important because they release or they break down the dead matter and release nutrients back for recycling. So here we have a picture of um, mushrooms found or fungus found on a tree stem. Now, if we did not have decomposers, what do you think will happen? Well, for one, we definitely would not have recycling of nutrients so that new plants are, would not be able to grow. Animals that feed on plants will have nothing to feed on and therefore the entire ecosystem, the food chain and the food web will be affected. And secondly, if we didn't have decomposers, we would definitely have a buildup of dead matter around in the environment. Finally, we want to look at symbiosis. Symbiosis is a long-term, close relationship between two or more organisms. So these have to be different species, and they have to be in contact with each other over a long-term period. So we have three types of symbiotic relationships. It can either be parasitism, commensalism or mutualism and let's go through each of them in one instance you can have a relationship where one organism benefits from that relationship and the other is harmed what do you think that one will be parasitism commensalism or mutualism definitely that would be like a parasite so this is parasitism so here we have the mistletoe, whose scientific name is really tree thief or tree thief, 
because the mistletoe would slowly pull nutrients from the plant that it grows on, eventually killing its host. Mosquitoes, ticks, and mites are also parasites, so they take blood from the host, and the host is harm, and the parasite benefits from the relationship. Here we have a particular hookworm that lays its eggs on butterflies. So here are the larva of the hookworm, and they lay their eggs on caterpillars. So as the larva and the maggots emerge, they are going to start feeding on the soft tissue of the caterpillar, slowly killing that caterpillar. So this is a definite example of parasitism. Two organisms in close relationship, but one is harmed and the other benefits. What about a relationship where one organism benefits and the other one isn't bothered? They're neither harmed nor are they benefiting from the relationship. In that case, it is called commensalism. Organisms living closely, but only one benefits from the relationship. The other one, there's neither a benefit or a harm. So for example, we have these um, prison fish, um, pilot fish, sorry, that swim very close behind or to the side of a shark. These fish feed off of the little pieces of food that the shark discards. The shark isn't bothered by these fish that are swimming along with them and the pilot fish are going to benefit from this relationship because they get food from the shark. The shark is neither harmed nor does it benefit from the, the relationship. The only benefiter, benefiter here is the pilot fish. And then we have the example that we all know of, of the cows and the egret. As the cow walks through the field, it raises up insects which the birds feed on. The cows are not bothered by the birds. They don't benefit from the relationship except in the instance where the, the birds eat the, the flies straight off the cow's back. But generally, the cows aren't benefiting from the relationship, nor are they harmed. The egret, on the other hand, has full benefit because they get food in abundance. And finally, there's the relationship where both organisms benefit from the close relation. And that is what we call mutualism. Mutual benefit. So here we have Finding Nemo and his dad. But they are actual clownfish and they live among these anemones here. So these are sea anemones. And these tentacles are actually quite poisonous to any other fish but the clownfish. So the clownfish would hide between the tentacles of the sea anemone. So the sea anemone provides it with protection and they also provide it with food. The anemone benefits now because the clownfish is going to eat and remove algal growth from within the tentacles of the fish, of the sea anemone, and they also lure other fish which get stung, and the clownfish will benefit from that. So the both organisms benefit from the relationship together. So let's go that again. The sea anemone gets cleaned, and it gets rem so removal of algal growth from the sea anemone and the sea anemone also gets waste nutrients from the fish so as the fish defecates the anemone is going to use that in its development the clownfish gets a home it gets protection and the clownfish also helps to lure fish in that are then eventually stung by the tentacles of the sea anemone And of course, we have butterflies and flowers. How do they benefit each other? The butterfly gets nectar and the flowers get their pollen transported to another flower for pollination. So what have we learned today? We looked at food chain and food webs and we now understand that a food chain shows the progress of energy transfer through an ecosystem or through the environment. We have defined various levels of consumers. We looked at primary, tertiary, and secondary consumers. We looked at words like predator,
prey, producers, carnivores, herbivores, omnivores. We looked at special relationships, meaning mutualistic relationship, parasitistic, and commensalism relationships. And finally, we explained the role of decomposers. These break down dead matter and release nutrients back into the environment. I do thank you for paying attention and stay tuned to other series coming up. This has been brought to you by the Division of Education, Innovation and Energy. Please have a blessed day.